Hi, I am Barbara Friedberg, former portfolio manager and university investments instructor here today with the renowned Paul Merriman, who actually needs no, no introduction. He writes for MarketWatch, he writes for AAII, he has a charitable website and has been a champion of the individual investor for decades. We are here talking about his four fund portfolio. And the goal for today is to help you learn if this portfolio might work for you and how to implement it. So welcome, Paul. So happy to have you. Barb, thank you so much. It's a thrill. Thrill to be here. And uh, I love your energy. You got me all pumped up. I'm ready to go. <laughs> so let's get started. I am going to turn the screen over to you okay. and let you go. And I may chime in with questions as Great. we go along. Great. You just hang on one sec, make sure I got the, the right one here. There we go. All right. Well, we're going to be talking about the four fund strategy, but I want to make sure that people understand what it is that we're trying to do with this procedure here and, 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 and showing you how we kind of built this strategy with two things in mind. How can we get a better rate of return and how can we take less risk? Now, we may debate about what risk is. I mean, some people think that a, a T-bill is low risk and a stock is high risk. Well, that might be true one day at a time, one month at a time, but when we look at a decade or, or over a lifetime, one would probably say in many ways, the T-bill is more risky. And so as we think of that unit of return per unit of risk, let's dive in to this uh, four fund strategy. Now, we wanted to be able to test this as far as we possibly could. And it turns out that there is in fact, uh, a lot of information uh, on the internet or, or through uh, some large organizations. Hang on here, I wanna get this full screen for you if I can, hang on. Are you seeing it full screen, Barb? I sure am, Good. loud Good. and clear. And Good. Paul, I want you to tell us what the four funds are too. That's exactly where I'm gonna go right Great. now, thank you. A lot of investors believe the total market index is the way to invest, uh, both US and international. And I totally agree that the total market index has you in the right asset classes. They got large, they got small, they got value and growth. That would be true of the US, that would be true of the international total market indexes, but they do not give you very much exposure to small or value that you can in fact create on your own. And that's what I wanna show you how to do because the four major US equity asset classes that are being used are small cap value. Let's look here from 1930 to 2019, small cap value, small cap blend, large cap value, and the S&P 500. Hold and on, Paul. I've got to ask you, value has been a horrible performer for the past 10 years. Why are we even doing this? Well, you must have read my mind. <laughs> Look, <laughs> 10 years doesn't mean very much. If you think 10 years is, is an enough time to, to determine where we should, should put our money. Let's just for a second, look here at the bottom of the period from 2000 to 2009, the S&P 500 compounded at a loss of almost 1% a year. What do we do? Throw it out, get rid of it? I mean, is it is it not worthy of being in our portfolio anymore? No, we like the S&P 500, even though over a long period of time, it has the lowest return of these four asset classes, but that's the way it should be. The reason it has the lowest return is because it is also theoretically the lowest risk equity asset class. Now, this table also includes bonds, long-term government bonds and T-bills, so that th those are very different, less risky asset classes, but even they perform well sometimes. Talk about 10 years, Barb. Look here, back in 1930 through 1939, long-term government bonds made 4.9%. And in fact, they made more than 4.9 if you take into consideration inflation because it was a deflationary period. So the real returns were actually higher. And of course, as we all know, or probably know, the worst place to be in that period was in equities. And the very worst was small cap and large cap value. 
So there are conditions under which value, large and small, are not going to perform well. But I am not worried about the next 10 years. I'm thinking long term. Now, let's then look at this other color, colorful uh, component. That's the four fund uh, combo. Instead of having a little bit of small cap and a little bit of value, what we're doing is we're treating these four major asset classes as equals. So it's 25% in the S&P 500. By the way, total market index has virtually the same return over the last 93 years. 25% in large cap value, 25% in small cap blend. What does blend mean? Some growth and some value. And the final 25% in small cap value. And then that's your, your, your four fund, US four fund combo. And we can see how it performed. It was never at the top and it was never at the bottom. We'll see that clearly in just a second. But notice all of these decades that small cap value was the best place to be and not by a little bit. But my view is this, the competition, if there's any tug of war going on in terms of a fork in the road, is should I be in the S&P 500 or should I use the four fund combo? Let's look at this table three. In table three, we've gotten rid of all the noise. All we're doing is looking at the S&P 500 and the four fund combo. And I'm thinking, which one is more risky? Well, I guess the one way I could look since we're looking at decades is how often did they end up at the top and how often did they end up close to the bottom? And close to the bottom, by the way, or worse yet, at the bottom, is it's, it's, it's the worst thing that could happen to a lot of investors because, Barb, you just hit it on the nose. If something underperforms from 10, for 10 years, people start to think that, that it's bad. It should not be in the portfolio. Well, here's what I note. I note the S&P 500 down here at the bottom in 2000 to 2009, close to the bottom in 1970 to 79, underperforming the four fund combo in 50, the 60s and the 40s. In fact, in almost every 10 year period, the four fund combo had a better rate of return. And I don't just mean by an eighth of 1% or something. No, sometimes it is almost the same, like 30 to 39, virtually the same. But then from 1940 to 49, about a 5% difference. And if you look, and I, and, and I included a PDF for Barb that she can give you on her, uh, when she writes this program up, and you can take a look at these and study them uh, slide by slide because there's some terrific lessons in here. So I'm thinking, and I'm concluding when I look at this, that I'd rather be in the four fund combo. Not only is the expected rate of return almost 2% more per year, which is a huge difference, I think the risk is actually lower. If we look out 20 years, starting in 1940, where we have uh, these four 20 year periods, again, small cap value and large cap value are at the top. The four fund combo, just as steady as it can be in the middle. And the S&P mostly down here where it's supposed to be. Remember, it is the least risky of the equities. The, the asset classes we expect to be at the absolute bottom are going to be the least risky. That, of course, are the government bonds long term or 30 days. But tell me, Paul, yes. we're talking about the past. And of course, that's all we have, because as far as I know, nobody's got a crystal ball. What are the drivers that make small cap value and small cap blend so attractive that we can be confident that they will be outperforming in the four fund portfolio going forward? Well, that obviously is, it's the, the magic $64,000 question. The real answer is nobody knows. What we do know, uh, and this comes out of the academic community, we do know that higher risk investments over time tend to produce, uh, they're more risky when you get higher rates of return. And so there's nothing magic here small cap and small cap value. In fact, even large cap value is more risky on a short-term basis than the uh, S&P 500. So the question becomes, do we expect the future to look like the past? Do we expect to get a premium for having the small cap uh, in the portfolio or the value in the portfolio? The probabilities are, yes, we will. But I must warn you, there are 10, 15, and 20-year periods 
after which basically you've made the same return in small cap value as you have in the S&P 500. So what people expect when they hear 2% more a year, 5% more a year, they expect it now. I want what I want when I want it. And that's not the way the market <laughs> works. It takes patience. And I'm 77. It's, it's not a, I'm, I'm so old that I may not ever get the premium for small cap value, but I am investing for other people uh, that are going to survive me. So I do have small cap value as part of my portfolio and large cap value, even though I may not participate in that wonderful historical uh, premium. But your question is always a good one. Who can tell us what the future will bring? All we have to do is go back a couple of years and talk about how well prepared we were for a pandemic. <laughs> Not very. That's right. Um, this obviously is a lot of small numbers, but I love this graph. I just think, and, it, and this table, because what it does, it helps you gain perspective for this expectation you might have for a higher rate of return, and maybe will help you have the patience it takes for any strategy to work in the long term, because every strategy will disappoint, uh, at least in the short term, and even often, like the S&P 500 did for a decade, uh, in what we consider to be the long term. But we have numbers from the academic community that have looked at every large company, every small company, all the value, all the growth, and created these asset classes, indexes of asset classes. So I can go all the way back here to 1928, and I can see that the S&P 500 wasn't the worst in 1928. The S&P 500 was in fact the best in 1928. And small cap value, supposed to be the hero, was next to last. In fact, large cap value was even worse than small cap value. By the way, they were worse but they were still profitable. Just because something underperforms does not make it bad. It could still perform at a level that people would say, well, that's good enough for me. Right. And so all of these colors will show you where the S&P was the best, where the, pur oh, the purple, the four fund, never number one. Not once were they number one. It's impossible when you're the average of the, of the four to be number one but they are also never the worst in the group. Most of the time, they're right in the middle. And if being right in the middle ends also getting a higher rate of return than what we call the market, the S&P 500, that historically is really a good deal. I just want to highlight four years to show you how wild these gyrations could be. And by the way, if you're a Morningstar fan, you can look in the style box on a daily basis and you may be surprised the huge difference between large companies and small companies, between growth companies and value companies. Just in one day, you can have a literally a 1% difference in one day return in these different asset classes. So they are all over the place, whether it's daily or annually. Look at 1997. It was a great year for the S&P 500. Nobody complained about being up 33.4, but the reality was the four fund strategy was up 35%, the small cap value up 39. Just when you thought you found financial nirvana, the next year, small cap value is not only at the bottom, you got to put your seatbelt on on this one. It was down 5% in that particular year. In a year, the S&P 500 was up 28.6. Well, just so you're ready for it. If we look at the annual difference in return on average between small cap value and the S&P 500, it's about 14% a year. So expect these broad differences. Then the next year, again, the S&P 500 was up here close to the top, but small cap value was still at the bottom. And then in the fourth of these four years, I'm sorry, let me go back. The small cap value surges to the top, up 20.5, the S&P 500, 9.1. Has anybody in your life ever suggested it's a good idea to buy a whole bunch of companies because when you own a whole bunch of companies, you know, some will do well sometimes and others will do poorly, but you diversify. And when you diversify, you lower your volatility. We can debate about what the final return is going to be, but you do lower volatility. And guess what? The four fund strategy does that automatically because you got too big, the small, the value, the growth. And we're not covering it here, but you could have an international global strategy that's part US, part international, part large, part small, part value. You can do that just as easily with four funds, but we can't go back to 1928. 
I'm not going to spend about a second here, but I want you to know this is in the PDF. My view of my job is this. I want to teach people about asset class investing. That also includes fixed income and the implications of combining equity with fixed income. So we have uh, about 150 plus tables, not just of the asset classes, but what it looks like when you invest on an annual basis, what it looks like when you take money out on an annual basis. But I will just highlight here, we have 100% bonds. There's 10% equity, 20 equity, all the way over to 100% equity and no bonds. You can look one year at a time and determine how much did you make or lose compared to the more risky or the less risky strategies. And down here at the bottom, because we think knowing about the losses, every bit as important as knowing about the gains, we want to make sure you're aware none of these combinations are low risk. But how much would you have lost for the worst year, the worst three years, the worst five years? Live with reality, no reality. I truly believe if you gain the knowledge that gives you the confidence that it will, it will give you a much higher probability of having the discipline to stay the long term. And I don't know anybody from, from, from John Bogle to, to even the great speculators of, of history, they would all say it is about the ability to stay the course. Warren Buffett says it just as well. And to give you a taste of what you could look at if you put your money to work, here's a table that shows, given the, the, uh, uh, the four fund strategy, how would it have performed putting away $83.33 a month starting in 1970 and increasing that every year and holding these different combinations? Huge differences in what you have to live on. Huge differences on what you leave to others. And I'm not going to spend any time on this, but to tell you about it, we have a brand new calculator that allows you to put your numbers into these tables, your amount of money you're saving, your amount of money you're taking out uh, for distribution. So I hope you'll check out the calculator and I hope you'll check out our website. And let me just say before I leave this, if you want to get the best we have to offer educationally, look under the best advice uh, link. And that is all of the serious information for investors who are committed to being a do-it-yourselfer and trying to figure out what's the right balance of equity and fixed income and uh, and what, should, what ride should I expect? Now, Barb, I'm, I've I've kept you quiet for way too long. I know it's, you got to be sitting there. Is he ever going to take a breath, please? No, this is such useful information. And I'm so glad that we have a view of your newly designed website because there's so much research and there's so much information. Don't let the complexity scare you because he's also got a lot of articles that break it down quite simply. And in the bottom of the notes, you're going to get links to the PDF. You're going to get links to all sorts of resources that are going to help you DIY this. We may even have a link to a pre-made uh, for fund portfolio for That's you great. as well. I thought you had, don't you have an M1 portfolio that does this? I do. And we are going to provide a link for that as terrific. well. That's terrific. And, and I guess I, you must go into M1 when, when you, when you uh, have an opportunity. And certainly I too am a great fan of that. And what an easy way to put not only this US only one, Barb, but also if they wanted to put the, the global one, have you got that one up or just the US? I have several different portfolios on okay. M1 that I share that give a variety of different strategies that you can kind of check out yourself. So yeah. I think this is inspiration and education for you to figure out how do I want to invest for the long term? Now, before we wrap up, I can't leave without talking to you about bonds mm. because we always, and both Paul and I are old school. We remember the days when you could actually get a five, 8% return on bonds. We don't know when that's going to come back, but give us an idea for our younger viewers as to why we should even think about bonds in our diversified portfolios. Well, you should think about bonds if you have need for money in the next year or two or three. That bonds are a perfectly normal thing to do. If you're putting money away for the long term, let me, as best I could possibly convince you, do not 
invest in bonds when you're in your 20s and your 30s when that money is for the long term. And let me tell you why this is so important. Again, remember my goal, and I've got a book entitled, We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. And one of them is to have your money in equities, not in bonds, because for every 10% you put in bonds, you are going to reduce your long-term return along with the equities that you have by about one half of 1% a year. A half of 1% a year is golden. And so please, bonds are not for young people. Yes, the market goes down. Yes, it would be nice to have bonds in the portfolio to, 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 to shelter or to save you from losing as much money as those who have all their money in equity are going to lose. But there's another side of that coin that is so important. You, when you are dollar cost averaging, as you are in your 401k or hopefully your IRA, you are going to buy more shares of these great companies when the market is down. And so if you, if you have bonds in the portfolio, it keeps you from maximizing the, 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 the treasures that you get with lower prices. And I'm talking not for the short term, but for the long term. Having said that, I'm not only an old timer but I'm old. And at 77, <laughs> my wife and I have 50% of our money in bonds because 50% in bonds means that if we have a big bear market, I'm going to have enough money on the break. See, I see stocks are the gas and breaks. That's, that's bonds that when the market goes down like 20, 25% with the 50% in bond, let me put it this way. If the market goes down 50%, I'm going down 20 to 25%. And that's okay, but 50% of my age, not okay. But for you, young investors, it is okay. It's opportunity. It's one of the best opportunities, just like when you get a match on your 401k. Easy money, free money. Well, so is buying low cost. By the way, never individual companies in my mind. I'm talking hopefully index funds that are massively diversified to protect you against the catastrophic event that any individual company can suffer. So loved that explanation and hats off to the young investors and those that have a little less time on our clocks. Yep. So before we wrap up, tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can learn more about you, get your resources. Well, they can look at the next slide if they want. <laughs> not only, by the way, not only can you sign up for our newsletter at Paul Merriman, uh, Paul at Paul Um, uh, excuse me. I want to say that again. If you go to paulmerriman.com, you can not only sign up for the newsletter, but if you click right here, you can sign up for the newsletter and get a free PDF of our latest book, We're Talking Millions. And I hope you will do that because uh, I think that book will add a lot of money to your lifetime returns. And uh, you can always drop me a note, paul at paulmerriman.com and say, I agree. I'd love to hear from you. But that's the easy way to get to our work. Thank you so much. I loved having you on again. And Thank for those you, of you that cannot get enough of Paul, I have another interview where we talk asset allocation. I'll put that on as well on our notes. And Paul has tons of podcast videos. So please sign up. We've got links to M1 portfolios where you can just click and copy a portfolio and fund that to get access to the four fund portfolio. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Barb. And if you like this channel, please subscribe, give us a thumbs up. And the link to M1 Finance might be an affiliate link, which will go to fund our channel, but you don't have to use that link. As usual, Paul, I loved chatting with you. Thank you so much Thanks. for sharing your wisdom. And I will see you next time. Thank you, Barb.